The time is 2 o'clock, so we will go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, my name is Desmond Martin. I am the Program Coordinator for Next Wave STEM, and we are so, so glad to have each and every one of you with us today. This is how to build a dynamic hybrid learning model. Um, this is another one of the webinars in Next Wave STEM's summer and now going into the fall free professional development webinar series. Uh, we are really, really excited because this is a chance for us to reach out to you as educators who really have a passion in educating our students in STEM. And we know that there are many of you coming from lots of different backgrounds. That's really exciting to see. Um, at Next Wave STEM, we believe in you as educators. Uh, we believe in our students to be able to learn using the STEMs in a hands-on way. Um, we know for a fact that many of you are very ingenious problem solvers. Um, we are in the midst of a pandemic, which is causing us all to really think critically and creatively and employ skills, technologies, and strategies that we may have never considered before. Um, and that's something that we're going to get a chance to talk about today when we think about developing a hybrid model that's dynamic, um, that idea of dynamism, having the ability to be flexible in what we do in hybrid learning um, in the fall where there's lots of information we don't know, um, it's going to be critical for us to build successful STEM programs. Um, but before I get too far ahead of myself, um, we do need to talk a little bit about the house rules. Um, the first is that we are in a webinar mode today. Um, that means for as camera ready, as we know that everyone is, um, your microphones and your cameras will be turned off. Um, the only voice that you'll be able to hear is my own. Um, fortunately, um, that does not mean that you are completely voiceless. Um, there is a chat and Q&A functionality available on Zoom. I'm sure many of us have become Zoom experts in the last uh, few months or so. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you've got some funny commentary, uh, feel free to drop that in the chat. Um, if you do have a question, we'll make sure to get that question answered on air. Um, but if you need some time to think about some things and maybe have some questions towards the end, we will have a QA and a um, period for you to answer your questions at that point. Uh, the second bit of housekeeping is with regards to our professional development credit hours. Um, for our Illinois educators, um, you will be able to claim today's webinar as one hour of professional development. We will be sending you the certificate of completion after the webinar today and the follow-up email. Um, in addition to receiving that certificate of completion, you will also be receiving a copy of the slide deck from today's webinar and you will also be receiving a link to the YouTube video for today's recording as well. So if you have to jump off a little bit early or you're just thinking of your colleagues um, who would really benefit from seeing the webinar, um, this is something that you can hopefully take as a continuing resource. Um, with all of that being said, um, we will go ahead and jump right into it. So a great place to begin is really at the beginning. Um, and the beginning for us is talking about Next Wave STEM, a little bit about who we are and why we do what we do. Um, without really focusing on what you see on the slide, um, Next Wave STEM is founded with this idea that hands-on learning in emerging technologies is going to make a huge difference for our students. Um, we recognize that there are many really pressing problems. Um, before we had to make adjustments with hybrid learning because of the pandemic, um, there were problems and still are problems with global food shortages and climate change and people being able to receive potable water or access to technology that would even allow for hybrid or remote learning. Um, those are real problems that persist right now and we believe those solutions are not only going to be legislative, um, not only going to be economic, but are going to be technical solutions. They're going to be things that require our students to have robust skills and STEMs and um, to be able to fulfill so many of those uh, empty STEM positions that we hear so much about in the news. Um, but we know that they just can't magically become STEM experts. Um, they can't learn if they don't have teachers to teach them. And um, that's where you come in. 
um, we recognize our educators as a critical component to our students' STEM learning, which is why we say our goal is to empower the teachers of today um, to prepare the students for the future. Um, you guys are critical. Next Wave STEM, we believe that our courses K through 12 in STEM um, that are at this point really introductory for our students and maybe introductory for you as educators are a great way to get your students not only practicing with the specific technologies, but to encourage them to feel as though they actually belong in STEM careers. So um, that's a little bit about who we are. Um, myself, uh, once again, I'm the program coordinator. That means uh, my job is really to manage the relationship between our schools that are doing professional development and running these professional development webinars. Um, my actual formal training is in mechanical engineering and I serve as subject matter expertise for Next Wave STEM in curriculum development as well. So I'm really excited to share a little bit about what we do at Next Wave STEM, um, how we're making adjustments for our courses in the fall, and maybe sharing some ways for you to do the same. Um, just so that you can have some really robust resources for your students. So in today's webinar, we have two goals that we really want to focus on. Um, we think that if we can do these two things, um, we can be in a much more solid position with regards to having some flexibility in your STEM programs with the fall. Um, the first is that we want to explore some particular ways in which STEM courses can be delivered both in person and remotely. Um, it is going to be really important, we think at Next Wave STEM, to be able to deliver some experiences for students that are going to be different than what they may have been doing for the last few months, which is just staring at their screens. Um, working in digital media or maybe reading things that they have access to if they pick them up from the school or have access to their local library system. Um, our students have been hanging in there. They miss our physical presence. And one of the ways in which we can continue to broaden their learning, enhance their curiosity, build those 21st century skills is going to be the ability to do hands-on learning, even if that hands-on experience may be at their own home. The second thing that we want to do is develop a framework for planning that provides instructional options. Um, after we take a look at the specifics, and in our case, we're going to take a look at some specific technology examples, we want to talk about more broadly um, how you can make considerations for your STEM programs that will allow you to kind of have the flexibility that you need, given that you can't predict the future. Um, but given that we can't predict the future, we can plan for a couple of likely scenarios. So that's what we'll jump into um, a little bit later on in our webinar. Um, one other housekeeping note, because I can already hear myself. Um, I'm excitable. <laughs> and when I get excited, that means that I can sometimes speak pretty quickly. Um, if I'm going too fast. I will take no offense for you to say, hey, Desmond, slow it down in the chat. Um, we can back it up and just make sure that we're communicating clearly. With that being said, we will go ahead and press forward. So first and foremost, let's talk about the hybrid learning model. Um, the world looks extremely different with regards to our back to school plans for the fall um, right now than even they did a month ago. Um, we're seeing major districts all across the United States um, start to make some concerted efforts towards pivoting towards a hybrid learning model for the fall. And even with that being said, those plans are still up in the air. Um, we see some large districts, especially out west, that are going um, completely remote for the fall. Um, we're seeing a mixture of different models where we see some student populations like high school students maybe um, in complete remote where um, pre-K and K through two may be in the school building. It really depends on your district. It depends on your location. Um, it unfortunately depends on the state of transmission in your particular location. Um, but there are different things that are going on and we're seeing hybrid model more and more 
come into play with regards to lesson delivery for the fall. So we want to talk about what the hybrid model is, and if you're not already extremely familiar with it, and then we will talk about where STEM kind of fits in with regards to a hybrid learning model. So the important thing to understand about the hybrid model before we even consider how it might actually work is the reason why we actually want to do it. Um, the hybrid model um, prioritizes student and staff wellness first. Um, there is no point <laughs> in doing instruction with our students if we cannot do it safely. Um, the second thing the hybrid model attempts to do is to create high quality learning experiences for all students. Um, that once again gets into this idea of having uh, the necessary flexibility to educate diverse student populations. Um, we're talking about our CTE students. We're talking about our English as second language students. We're talking about our special education students. There's got to be a level of flexibility and investment to allow experiences for them to be rich as well. And the third thing the hybrid model prioritizes is high need student support. For our students that we know need that extra time um, with us as instructors for enrichment, for example, or need extra access to facilities or technologies to complete their projects. Our students that we know are making a concerted effort and need more resources to find success. Um, the hybrid model also prioritizes in as much as we can making those resources available. Um, more than anything, it just creates um, scenarios where students are able to access curricula and resources um, that are gonna be engaging and high, have a high level of efficacy, um, no matter what kind of physical situation we find ourselves in. So with that understanding of what the hybrid model is, what it's gonna prioritize, that actually helps us frame and reframe what our STEM learning goals are gonna be. Um, one thing I wanna do is I actually just wanna pause for 30 seconds and poll our audience. We've got a pretty good group size here today. Um, what are some of your goals? Um, you may not put anything in the chat or you may have one or two goals, but if you're doing STEM education this fall, um, what general goals do you have? And I will literally set a 30 second timer for myself so that um, we give us a little bit of chance to answer. And there is no bad thing as a goal. No such thing as a bad goal, I should say. Oh, meeting the students where they are. That is an amazing goal. That's more than a notion with respect to, to getting where we wanna go in STEM for the fall. Oh, we have a really good comment here to keep online students engaged with the students that are in person. Yes, yes, and yes. We'll talk about what that may look like in terms of even age and grade stratification, but actual physical logistics for instructions. Oh, yes, to engage in authentic hands on engineering, um, to engage students in authentic learning experiences, uh, to be able to teach students how to collaborate both in person and distance learning. Absolutely. Uh, I love it because a lot of these goals that we have are really baked into what we want to see in STEM. Um, in a more general traditional learning sense. Better critical understanding of me and students to our universe, bodies, and mind. Um, I'm hearing some NGSS goals also pop out there, which is really, really good, really robust. This is awesome. Thank you all so much for answering those questions. Um, these are great STEM goals, and the hybrid learning model can also help us get to these really really awesome goals that you have. So the great place to begin is to think through your learning objectives. And as you're thinking through your learning objectives, um, it's important to think about our specific lesson objectives, but also what our learning experience is gonna be for our students holistically. Um, your class, 
for STEM is not the only experience that they're going to have. And while we want that to be the most robust experience that we have, um, I guess the first tip for hybrid learning that you can um, glean from this just foundationally um, is to collaborate with your school and with your other instructors and staff at your school. Um, there are some fundamental things that you want to accomplish and that you can be thought leaders on when it comes to developing a hybrid model for your school. Um, the first is that your teaching methods, those classroom expectations are similar for students. So it makes it easier for them to adapt to those situations where they're going to be doing remote and virtual instruction. Um, it is jarring and we've even seen data from our students so far. It is jarring, it is difficult, it is disengaging for our students who have been doing um, virtual instruction to see those instructors. There may be three, um, I think on the high end we say four instructors, different instructors that um, students have had to engage with during the course of a virtual learning day. And it's jarring because um, we're all trying to figure out the best that we can. So we don't necessarily have all of our best practices reified and codified. Um, how could we? We barely had any time to really prepare that. So as you're working with your school, as you're getting ready for the fall, basically what you're doing right now and engaging in professional development but also collaborating with your team about what your lesson design is going to be, um, how you're going to execute your lesson targets, how you're going to move in between learning targets. Creating that sense of expectation is going to be huge for your students. They are missing that in large part because of their being pulled away from the physical space of the classroom. Um, that's difficult and that's something that has to be overcome. So it's a great, great place to start to be able to say, okay, uh, I know that my students in the fifth grade, um, when they have my class and they have the three classes following or the two classes following, they're going to be receiving similar experiences. Um, we're going to be using the same tool with regards to video chat. We're going to be uh, executing this in the same way and they can still be in with us because we're not pulling them all over the place with how we deliver or even our technical capabilities. Um, and the second thing that I really want to focus on is that we want to work with con concepts and technology that can bridge various core subject areas. Um, something that we're going to talk about with regard to our particular technologies is that they are useful not only in the context of a STEM or an engineering course. Um, they, of course, are designed for that specifically, but they've got cross subject matter potential that makes them really, really exciting for students to use them not only in your class, but also in their core subjects. Now, the big caveat on this is that for a lot of us who are gonna be teaching core subject matter, um, we still don't know what assessment is gonna look like. And we can't ignore that until we get more guidance on that, um, whether that's standardized testing or just even your district requirements. A lot of those things are still being worked out. Um, with that being said, um, we want to take advantage of the low hanging fruit to keep our students engaged, especially if the technology can be hands on. So those two things, creating a consistent experience across your students class load so that there's a little bit less cognitive load on figuring out, okay, how do I work in my STEM class? How do I work in my English class? How do I work in my math class? If we can kind of make it easier for them to not have to switch their brains in their different modes, um, just logistically each time they come to class. And then after that, if we can bring in um, technology that can bridge different subject areas, and that's coming through the collaboration with your colleagues as well, we've got something set up that's going to be really effective and really engaging for our students. So that's a great place to start, is just through the collaboration with your school staff. Now the second place, um, I know a lot of us didn't expect for the first <laughs> place to start to be collaboration, but the second place to start is um, actually in the technologies that we choose. Um, Next Wave STEM, we offer courses K through 12 in technologies like drones, um, 3D printing, um, computers, and artificial intelligence at the high school level, and also robotics. Um, the reason why we focus on these technologies, two parts. Um, they're emerging, meaning that 
they've either been around for a short amount of time or they really are on the bleeding edge of technology offerings. Um, the reason why we focus on the emerging side is that we want to give students exposure to technologies that are going to be relevant to their work in the future. We have a really robust understanding that your students are not going to get away from careers where artificial intelligence is going to be more and more a part of how they will get their work done. Their students are not going to be able to get away from careers where drones and robotics and even 3D printing is going to continue to increase in the way that they're able to get their work done. And even more than that, going back to the way that we focus on our mission at Next Wave STEM, um, these technologies are gonna be foundational to some, solving some huge, huge global problems. So that's the first thing. Um, we know that it's gonna be relevant. But the second thing is that it's hands-on and can be accessible for your students. Um, and I know that's kind of the big question mark is, okay, how are drones accessible for my students if they're at home? Or is, how are 3D principles accessible if they're at home? Um, those are gonna be our examples for today, um, drones and 3D printing. So when we think about integrating drones with our students, um, we understand that we are focusing primarily on some really robust STEM concepts. Um, there's, of course, computer science. They're programming using drag and drop block based coding to fly drones autonomously. Um, but they also have the ability to program these drones in Python. So if you're looking to build a really robust computer science program um, with a device, an actual physical output for the coding input, the drone becomes an amazing way to do that. Um, of course, you're building in math principles and in solving physical problems, you're building in engineering principles as well. Um, and the amazing thing about this is the technology is such that your students are able to program their drones remotely, but our drones are also sized in a way. They're actually pretty small. They're eight inch by eight inch drones that um, with the proper resources, we can get a physical drone to your students that could be flown indoors <laughs> or outdoors. Um, when we think about 3D printing, we're also engaging these really robust STEM principles um, in computer-aided design. So we're building that digital skill set, but we're also working through engineering. And particularly when we think about an actual product production versus a processes production. Um, in the in 3D printing um, vertical or technology, you could say, um, we're focused on cloud-based design. Um, that means that as long as your students have a device with persistent internet connection, they'll be able to design for 3D printing. Um, they can even move into the latter phases of actually preparing their physical machine. And then we have some hybrid options when it comes to how we actually execute the printing of their object, which is where we connect to a physical printer to slice and print. Um, the amazing thing about 3D printing is that technology has progressed in such a way that if there are resources available, um, we're able to actually get individual uh, printers to your students to 3D print at their homes. And for you, if you're at school that has a 3D printer, um, we can also take those designs that they're designing remotely, collaboratively with their students, and then print them at the school. So there are a couple of different ways that we can flex and bring these technologies to our students. Um, we're gonna really stay focused on drones and 3D printing when we talk about our hybrid uh, model and what we can do both in person and uh, remotely for our students. We'll, we'll dig much more in depth with that a little bit later. So now that we've kind of talked about the the technologies we've given you kind of the place to begin and then the next step thinking about our technologies um, we'll take a step back so that we can zoom in a little bit later we want to build a larger framework um, we want to think about what are the scenarios that we may find ourselves in with respect to instruction and how then can i make some decisions when it comes to the technology that i'm going to use and the concepts that i want to focus on that would actually allow for us to have 
first and foremost, some coherent <laughs> instruction, uh, then also allows us to get to those goals where we think about authentic hands-on engineering experience. We think about being engaging, where we're talking about collaboration both in person and remotely, which is really exciting because that reflects the nature of real world work, um, that collaboration in person and remote. Um, how can we build a framework that allows our courses in STEM to really still accomplish those goals? Well, I like to break it down into scenarios. Uh, there are some things that could happen. There are some things that are less likely to happen. Um, there are some situations that we are really preparing to move into. Um, and there are, of course, a few other scenarios that are really, really less likely. Um, but we like to break it down into these three timelines. Um, and these timelines intentionally don't have any dates on them because uh, if you asked me what's going to happen uh, with respect to a global pandemic, uh, one, I'm not an epidemiologist, and two, that's the best that I have for you. <laughs> so um, we have these three scenarios. Um, and these three scenarios, I've, I've actually kind of given them these informal names. Um, the surge of infection scenario, um, the not ready to return scenario, and then the hybrid instruction scenario. And in the surge of infection scenario, um, we can imagine that we have gotten to a place, um, and I'll caveat this is the least likely of these scenarios that we have on the board, um, but we can imagine that we've gotten into a place um, where our school district um, is seeing transmission levels low enough that it is safe for our students to return to traditional in-course, in-class in instruction. However, because we don't know a whole lot about what's going to happen in the future with respect to the pandemic, with respect to transmissions, it is possible that we might see a surge that necessitates a newly instituted stay-at-home order um, from whatever municipality we might find ourselves in. Um, that would cause us to go from that traditional learn at school to a remote learning scenario. Um, that's the first scenario that we want to consider with our drones and our 3D printing. The second scenario we want to consider, some of us may be finding ourselves in a situation, um, maybe even now, um, some of us may be finding ourselves in a situation a little bit later on with respect to say maybe 2021, not going to wood. Um, we are in this scenario, um, learning at home because we are still not out of the woods with regards to transmissions. Um, that means that our first responders, our public health officials are doing the best that they can. They're working hard. Um, we're working hard to try to uh, minimize those transitions. And we finally do get to a point where in-person instruction is safe. Um, that's our school announcing a reopening. Um, our courses will need to transition from us teaching virtually and doing remote work to things that allow us to jump into that course with the hands-on component. So that's the second part. Um, the first is that we're teaching, we're teaching um, traditionally with our hands-on courses in class, and then we had to transition that course to remote. Um, the second scenario is that we're teaching remote, and then we have to transition to hands-on. Third is the most likely option for many of us, which is the hybrid instructional model. And this can look like a couple of different things. This may be uh, a few days in class for one student population. Um, they might have virtual instruction some days and they might have remote instruction the other days. Um, and the second student population may be flip-flopped off their in-class schedule. Um, lots of different people are working in a lot of different ways, but that's the most common uh, format that we see for hybrid instruction. In the hybrid model, um, you've got students who are going to be jumping on in and out of in-course instruction throughout the course of the semester, maybe throughout the course of the school year. So they'll have to shift from doing portions of that curricula in class, doing portions of the curricula at home remotely or through virtual instruction, and then coming back and continuing the in-class, which actually creates a very interesting 
um, kind of opportunistic schedule flow for us as instructors. Um, depending on your situation, things can look very different logistically. But the amazing thing is that the emerging technologies that we use have the ability to flex with the schedule changes. So let's talk a little bit about what we mean by instructional flex by looking at this example in drones. In a situation where we might have a surge of infections with our drones, um, that means that we're teaching at school first. Um, for our drones course, students are going to be coding and flying in groups. They're going to be working together, collaborating, um, operating their physical drones in a safe and um, ethical way. Um, they're going to be coding. They're going to be building, dragging, and dropping their code, and refining their code, debugging their code, going through those actual flight scenarios and simulated flight scenarios in the course of their flights at school. And there's the community aspect to that as well, where we've collaborated with our staff, we've collaborated with our actual other faculty members if we're doing cross um, subject matter collaboration using the technology. And that's driving this engagement. But after that search, um, that doesn't mean that we're out of the game. Um, what we're able to do with our drone technology is actually simulate those flights. The same software that we use to code the drones to fly also has the ability to run a computer simulation right inside the software of the way the drone is able to fly in the real world. So that gives us the opportunity now to continue on with those coding tasks to build the coding skills. And our students aren't checked out. They're able to still run simulations of the flight. And once again, um, something that we do at Next Wave STEM, we make available to schools is the ability to actually purchase drone bundles so that you can get the drones into your students' hands. And that way they can continue to fly um, remotely away from the school grounds. So that's kind of that surge of infections situation. And are not ready to return. Um, where we start remotely and then we transition back to the classroom, that scenario is kind of flipped. So they start learning about the coding. Um, they start learning about the ethics of drone flight through simulation, through actually building in and watching the drone um, virtually flow and then and maneuver through a physical environment. We are simulating scenarios for actual applications, whether that is cartography, or whether that is meteorology, or whether that is package delivery. <laughs> we begin to simulate those situations using our software. But as we come back into our physical spaces with our drones and with our STEM curricula for our students, we're able to take all the software we've been developing and testing and now connect them to our physical drones. So now we have this awesome science opportunity where we can um, test the precision and the accuracy of our drones versus the actual simulations that we've been doing with our drones while we were running remotely. Um, and there we have the actual engineering um, opportunity as well where we're trying to decrease the delta, change and get the difference between our simulation and our actual execution as small as we can by making a slight changes in the design of our code and also of how we physically execute the flight with our drones. Um, that becomes really, really robust experience. Now, the hybrid model kind of takes those two experiences and fuses them together. Um, we are in class where we're learning our coding basics and physical safety protocols with respect to our drones. Um, our students will have a couple of days to be able to do that. Um, they can then transition to being remote in the remote situation that may look like virtual instruction where we walk them through live coding and back and forth collaborative experiences with their group members, their class members, and the instructor to get towards a solution for simulation. They may even practice simulating those flights to execute those tasks. And then when they come back to school, we may take the work with the remote and then execute and practice what we've done remotely to actually try to refine that. So you can see that in these three most likely scenarios for our drones, we give ourselves some options here. Um, we're not locked in necessarily to having um, the course run, run just one way. Um, and we're not cheating ourselves out of learning objectives because we know that our drones have 
a few different modalities of usage. So that's, that's drones, right? We, we kind of can see that there's this component of, with drone flights where because we're connecting computer science, um, we have a multi-process um, technology where we have to do the computer science and, and prep and then the physical flight and operation. And those processes let us subdivide and provide opportunities for both in-person and remote work. Um, but 3D printing, um, how does that compare? Um, is 3D printing a multiple step process technology? And if it is, how do those processes um, most make sense in our different scenarios? I am so glad that you asked <laughs> because uh, let's talk about 3D printing now. So when we think about instructional flex in 3D printing, we're thinking about those same scenarios. Um, before we get into 3D printing, we can, um, we can actually break 3D printing down into a set of three steps. Um, the printers, I compare them to automobiles all the time. Um, your Honda Civic and your Mercedes, they do basically the same thing. Um, you go to the gas station, you put in gasoline, your internal combustion engine burns that gasoline, powers the wheels on the vehicle, and you go from point A to point B. Um, you may get there a little bit faster. Your sound system may be a little bit nicer. Uh, you may burn a little bit more gas. Um, but at the end of the day, the technology is accomplishing the same thing. So with your 3D printer, your 3D printer may be a little bit bigger. Your 3D printer may be a little bit smaller. Your 3D printer may have three arms or two arms or six arms. Your 3D printer may print with slightly different filament technology, heat differently, sound differently. Um, but at the end of the day, that process for your 3D printer is going to be the same. And the steps of, that process, of those processes are first, you want to design your object. Second, you want to slice your object. Um, by slice, I mean literally taking that 3D design um, and putting it through a software that translates that design to your 3D printing machine, your specific machine. And then third, the print, the physical execution um, by which your 3D printer melts down your plastic and turns it into an object. Um, if you're really more interested in that, you're gonna see um, my contact information a little bit later on in the presentation today. Uh, we've got an upcoming webinar for that where we dig into the specifics of 3D printing some more. And it's a really, really cool technology. So when we think about Flex, the ability to um, instruct our students both in person and remotely, um, 3D printing gives us those opportunities because of those discrete steps. Um, in our service of infections, where we are in person, then going remote. Um, we start, of course, with computer-aided design and the skill building that, that we can really encourage in our students with the live instruction through Tinkercad. Um, if you have used Tinkercad before, you'll know already that's a really powerful tool for the design. Um, but we also get a chance to initiate the engineering design process. Our students are able to collaborate in small groups or even um, together as an entire classroom and really begin to define a problem for an end user, um, brainstorm, and then start moving towards design solutions. But if we get in a situation where we can't meet um, in person with our students um, and our students can't meet in person with each other, um, virtual instruction can push us more towards those engineering goals. Um, so our students, just because they're not physically in groups, doesn't mean that they cannot digitally be in groups. Um, that means digital breakout rooms. That means group chats. That means using their collaborative tools that they find in learning management systems, whether that's Office 365 or Google Suite or Google Classroom or however they um, collaborate. And the amazing thing with 3D printing is that um, once again, we can either give them the physical printer, a physical printer, or we can print for them, or we can contract that printing out to a third party service that will then physically deliver their object to them. Um, we've got lots of different ways where if that course has to finish remote, um, the fruit of their labor does not go to the wayside. 
in our second situation, um, where we're not ready to return, um, we start off remote and then get back into the classroom. Um, we'll start, of course, with the virtual instruction. That's where we're still building the skills and the digital design. Um, and we're also collaborating in that um, engineering design process as well. Once again, we're just digital doing that. Um, but we're also in a situation where we can um, digitally and remotely design for the specific printer that they have access to, whether that's something that they might have at home or something at your school, slicing software is free. And slicing software is going to remain free. Um, your students are able to take the designs and actually um, manipulate and translate those designs into something that their physical printers are able to use. That's something that they can do remotely, just as long as they have access to a computer. Um, and then once we return back into school, students have access to that physical printer. They take the digital work, they just take those um, 3D printing files, throw them onto your printer, and you're printing those and you're post-processing them. So once again, we don't lose the, the fruit of that labor. In the third scenario, hybrid, where we're going in between, the back and forth, um, we may start with computer-aided design, skill building in our classrooms, working with them, encouraging them, having them work together in groups. Um, we also, at that point, will initiate our engineering design process as well. Um, from there, we're virtual instruction and remote work where we're progressing. Our students are able to access Tinkercad at home once again, just as long as they have a stable internet connection. Um, it connects to Google Classroom as well. So you're also able to encourage and build with them as they go through that instruction. Um, and the amazing thing is that augmented reality, the ability for them to see their designs render via their smartphones or their iPads or their Android tablets comes into effect. Um, they can take those designs and kind of use their cell phones almost in the same way that many of our students play Pokemon Go and see those designs in the real world, quote unquote. They can see a mock-up of the way that design might actually function and look. So we're also getting that digital um, representation, that digital interaction for our students. But then they're going to be coming back to our classroom. So after they've designed, they've iterated with their students, um, with their with their teammates, um, they would come in and they would do physical printing. Um, they would do physical printing, they would do post-processing, but they would actually do testing. Does my physical object do what I want it to do? Does this door stopper that I 3D printed actually hold the door open? Does the headphone holder that I 3D printed actually hold the headphones from the side of the computer? Or are they just falling off the computer? Um, that's a chance for us to test and get actual feedback from instructors from other students and then do an iteration where we're designing. So that back and forth coming to and fro gives us uh, some really, really exciting, interesting opportunities. So I know that's really getting to the weeds there, but the important thing to understand is that you always want to consider a technology. In this case, drones and 3D printing that allows for instructional flexibility. Um, understand the scenarios that you may find yourselves in, um, build a chart even so that you can get check boxes for your different scenarios and think about selecting um, product and curricula that allows you to really change in between different situations and just be ready um, on the front end. So um, the amazing thing um, really exciting thing that we like to think about, something that I know most, if not all of you, have already worked on is thinking about this idea of what a virtual instructional experience might look like for your students. Um, how is this actually going to progress? We kind of have this idea of what in-person instruction looks like. Um, we've all learned how to do it. We have focused on that as of a part of our pedagogy is teaching our students who are right in front of us. Um, the difference um, skill set that we've had to develop and we'll have to continue to develop is the online instructional component. And for that, um, this is just a really broad um, example of a way lessons will be able to progress. Um, it may start with a whole group direct instruction where we're working still through a 5D lesson model. Um, we're engaging our students when we think about the real world problems that we're trying to solve with our technology. Um, and that may even be related to the pandemic. 
if it's drones, it may be considering how to um, socially distance deliver objects to people. Um, if it's 3D printing, it may be the production of personal protective equipment. Um, we make that actual world world connection for our students so that they can hook into and believe in the reason why they're working with the technology. Um, we explore that technology and that subject through whole group collaboration. Um, that's our back and forth that's moderated by our instructor. That's asking driving questions and allowing our students to consider driving questions. And that can be done either live or in breakout groups or even in a group chat. Your students love group chats. I <laughs> love group chats. Um, it is a great place to exchange ideas and know that our voices aren't going to be necessarily drowning out other voices. In the same way, we can break off into our small group chat. Um, that can be breakout rooms if you're using a tool like Zoom or your chat groups. And then we may come back once we have really ideated, um, built ourselves closer to the understanding of the technology with an explanation session. That's whole group moderator led learning once again. This may be the portion of our instruction where the um, instructor is actually showing our students how to execute the skills that they've explored when they engaged um, with that they explored in whole group collaboration earlier. From there, we get into the actual remote independent work of our students. Um, they may indeed be working with changing designs, changing the code, um, running experiments in simulation, and then the collaboration, the feedback point for you and students with each other, maybe group chat or through their LMS, through Google Classroom. Um, but then you also have the opportunity um, to do your evaluation moments. Um, those may even be your assessment moments. Um, your students know how to submit their assignments through Google Docs, Google Forms, um, Google Slides, um, Office 365. Um, if you don't know how to assign those things and work within those systems that may be available to your students, um, we really encourage you um, to actually grow your skills in that direction as well. So this is, a, this is the actual um, example of what this might look like in the real world for your students. So some thoughts here is that we're developing these skills and that means that we have to develop um, a set of supporting skills that we might not have had already. Um, this is really to empower your instruction as a, as a teacher, um, especially when you consider that hybrid learning is now exactly that, a mixture of in-person and digital learning. Um, our skill sets may be much, much stronger in one than in the other. Um, one thing that I really deeply encourage from all of, um, all of our attendees today, all of our participants, all of our educators, um, become an expert, become an expert, become an expert. I, I said it three times because it's that, it's that important. Become an expert in whatever learning management system your district uses, whether it's Google Classroom, Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, um, know how to upload files, know how to give feedback, know how to edit, know how to collaborate, know how to comment, know how to share. Um, the reason your expertise is going to be critical is because um, one, that <laughs> just allows you to physically be more responsive to your students to get those outcomes that we're looking for. Um, but secondly, it's going to open up some really exciting opportunities and creative ways for you to use the digital tools. Um, your students are going to be pretty good. We're going to continue to explore their learning and their skill sets through your expertise in the LMS. Uh, invest in the expertise is worth the time. So I know. I hit you with a fire hose of information. Uh, lots of information about different scenarios, different technologies, ways that we can collaborate with our actual colleagues to make that um, a really robust and meaningful experience for your students. Um, how can X Wave STEM help you out with that? What can we do specifically? Well, the first is what you're doing right now. Um, our webinar series is going to be continuing. 
Um, we have dates scheduled out into September and we will have some opportunities going forward out beyond there. Um, continue to grow your skill set. Um, continue to look for other development opportunities as well that are going to grow your specific skill set. Um, we're here to support you and we will be here to support you. Um, check out our PD videos that are online on YouTube. Um, that those are going to be there specifically because we want to make sure that as robust as your STEM program can be in whatever way we can help that happen, we're here specifically for that. The second is to consider Next Wave STEM as an actual resource for your instruction. Um, Next Wave STEM does live instruction um, virtually and in person in the in-school and out-of-school space. Um, for our hands-on experience, um, something that I alluded to a little bit during the course of the webinar, um, we will get you the full solution. That is um, getting the actual technology to, for your students, whether that's a robot, a 3D printer, or a drone, and conducting the instruction for your students. And we can do that both in school and out of school to accommodate your hybrid needs. Um, for our students who are going to be remote only, we also do remote only digital learning with our tools that are digital tools. When we think about drones and 3D printing. Um, if you're interested, reach out to us at Next Wave STEM, hello at Next Wave STEM, and we'll make sure that we get you um, more information about that offering. The third thing we do is curricula. Next Wave STEM has developed the curricula for our K through 12 courses, and we license the curricula to schools as well as a complete solution. That means you get access to the curricula. Um, once again, all the equipment that you need and training for your instructors. Uh, I am the PD guy, so I will personally conduct your instruction um, digitally and in person at a time when in person is a thing we can do again. Um, we want to make sure that we give you what you need so that you can have confidence that your programs are successful, that they're being run with fidelity, that you're meeting your STEM goals. So in x -ray STEM, we want to make sure that you have all the resources that you need as well that can seamlessly move from the in-person to virtual um, to remote uh, scenarios in hybrid learning. So I want to pause for a little bit because there's a lot of information there. Uh, and I want to open up the questions. Uh, do you have any questions about what a hybrid learning model might look like for um, the STEM that you're going to do specific at your school? Do you have questions about any other courses or any of the scenarios we talked about today? Um, do you have some predictions for the ways that STEM learning may progress in the future? Uh, we love to hear from you. So I will pause for now and let those questions roll in. The chat and the Q&A functionalities are both open. I know those fingers are probably going right now with the questions. So we'll just give that another minute just in case there's any questions that you might have. There's no such thing as a bad question. Well, I know many of us may be working through some more of those questions. We just had one come in. Ideally, how would we host in-person and remote learning at the same time? Oh, this is a great question. Um, what I'm imagining is we are talking about a scenario where we may have a class of students and we may have those students who are concurrent where there may be a group that's in-person in a group that may be um, remote at home and they're expected to engage with that instruction at the same time, um, kind of in that same temporal time. Is that, am I getting that right, Marsha? 
if that is the situation, yes, I got a yes there. Um, if that is the situation, that's where our technology with regards to actually broadcasting um, is going to become really, really important. Um, we don't see this being done so much, but this is something that we actually have experimented with at Next Wave STEM with regards to professional development. And what you're gonna have is kind of a situation where your in-person students become kind of their own separate breakout room. Your digital students are gonna be kind of in their digital breakout rooms. So for your live instruction, um, you're actually gonna see a model of instruction that follows closer to what we propose. Um, you may have whole group collaboration where you've got a video feed going out. Um, and that video feed, there may be multiple, is gonna be wide on your classroom and, and on you as an instructor. Um, if we can think of kind of a scenario where you might have um, your camera, and this is going to be an external camera, um, your camera is set up kind of towards the back room, facing up towards you, and you've got students in that scenario, um, you're going to have your live instruction. At the point where you're going to go small group, um, you'll find the situation where your in-person students are going to be small group, your digital students are gonna be small groups amongst themselves online, and you'll be managing um, that online component. So you'll be jumping kind of back and forth between the work at the front of the classroom or at your desk for your digital students, and then floating amongst your, your in-person students and floating back to your digital students. Um, you're gonna get a little bit of a workout. It's not like you sit at your desk the whole lot anyway, um, but you're gonna get a little bit of a workout transitioning in between those digital students, um, monitoring your chat and your online students from the computer, and then transitioning back into a wide shot for your um, whole class instruction, kind of so that you still have all those eyes um, on you as an instructor in the case of a classroom. Um, it's a little bit of a logistical challenge, um, but it's one that we're certainly willing to talk a little bit more about offline. Really, really great question there. And I know that uh, we may have a few other really good questions. That was a really good one. Well, in the event that we do have any more questions, I know that sometimes uh, we have to digest them. We might have some questions pop up a little bit later. Um, we would love to hear from you. Um, if you look at the slide, that is my face in black and white. If you uh, look at your presentation screen, that's my face in color. Uh, Desmond Martin, once again, and my email is really easy. Uh, Desmond at nextwavestem.com. And you can find us on most social media platforms um, at nextwavestem.com. That's Twitter, that's Instagram, that's LinkedIn, that's Facebook. Uh, we are not on TikTok. I do not know how to tick or how to talk. Um, we've got a couple of interns coming into Next Wave STEM, so maybe they might help us do that. Um, but shoot us an email, drop us a message, drop us a line. Um, if you've got questions about anything or if you want to get into the weeds for the curricula as well. Um, one other thing, I almost forgot it, uh, as a part of our follow-up email today, you will also have access to our sample curricula of resources. Um, there's going to be a link in the email that allows you to access that as well. Um, but I really, really, really appreciate each and every one of you for taking a little bit of your time to be with us today. Um, we are hopeful that this helps make your life a little bit easier as you transition into the fall, into this back to school season. Um, we are hopeful that you stay safe, that all your students stay safe, and we hope that you get towards all of those amazing STEM goals. Um, until we speak again, um, have an awesome rest of your day, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.